Respected brothers and sisters, respected scholars, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I start in the name of Allah, the omniscient, the omnipotent. All praise is truly due to Allah, for He has created us knowing of our strengths and knowing of our weaknesses. And it's up to you and I to transact in this existence that we may take our weaknesses and convert them to strengths. For we find that not everyone is created an all-powerful being except for Allah Azawajal, Him being the Creator is the only all-powerful that we know of. And our existence completely depends on Allah's existence. And we sometimes ask that, O oh Allah, You've created us with so much strengths and You've created us with so much weaknesses. Why would you create us knowing that we have strengths? Should you not create us 
if we were perfect without strengths, uh, sorry, without weaknesses. And the idea here is that you and I, as human beings, not one person possesses all the power or all the great qualities. It's separated between us mankind. And our goal, you and I, is to transact on this earth that we may help one another and share the powers which Allah has given us. For some have been created rich and some have been created poor. Some have been created physically able and some have been created uh, physically unable or disabled. The goal in our existence is that you and I come together to transact on a higher authority. Not to be stingy with what Allah has given us, but to share that which He has blessed us with. And diversity, this diversity that we live by, is the very message of our existence. We sometimes ask, oh Allah, you've taken such a small percentage of human beings and made them Muslims relative to how many human beings there are. And every time we ask that, there's an answer which keeps coming back. And Allah says, I've given you that responsibility that you need to go out there and spread the message that others know exactly what you are talking about. I can easily make everybody, and, and I can easily put anybody in Jannah. Imam Ali alayhi salam states in Dua Kumail, he says that you can put anybody in Jannah. You can easily put everybody in heaven, it's not a problem. And the hellfire would become ice cold and nobody would inhabit it, nobody would live in it. It's sim simple for Allah But why has He made our system built in with a struggle? It's because it's up to you and I to transact on what we have and what we don't have. And ever since our existence, our existence has been completely set around this idea of a transaction. Ever since Adam was created, and the reason I keep going back to Adam in my discussions is because what Imam alayhi salam came to establish was what Allah was trying to establish by putting Adam on this earth. And our Imams and our Prophets, all the way to our Imam Sahib al-Asri was zaman is one line of continuation where Imam al-Mahdi will come to fuel from the fire of Aba Abdullah and he will fuel from the message of the Messenger of Allah. Peace and blessings be upon him. Salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. You find that interestingly, within the first moments that Adam is created, or even before he is created, Allah states in the Quran, Inni ja'alun fil ardi khalifa, I am putting someone on this earth as a khalifa, as a representative to me, that with immediately the mala'ika go against Allah, not by action, but by idea. And they say, Oh Allah, you have created us and we worship you. You have created us and we are around you, we are worshipping you, we are glorifying you. What's the need that you need to create another individual who's going to cause bloodshed and harm? There's an interesting discussion here. And the discussion is not between you and me. The discussion is not between the Messenger of Allah and Amir al-Mu'mineen. The discussion here is between Allah, the Glorious, the Almighty, the All-Knowing, the All-Wise and His creation and His Malaika. Interestingly, the tolerance that Allah shows towards the Malaika instantly as they give their opinion that you and I should be the same way when we have dialogue. When it's time for us to discuss certain issues, whether they are secular issues, political issues, whatever issues that we have, we need to come to a level of agreement that we can tolerate each other. For if the Almighty can tolerate the angels as they speak their opinion, then surely you and I can tolerate each other as well. There should be a level of tolerance within our lives. Hence, there, there, was, there were a group of remarks made recently by Dr. Richard Dawkins. As you know, Dr. Richard Talking, Dawkins is an English ethologist as well as a uh, evolutionary biologist. And recently in a military expo, a very interesting comment was made. I came across it very swiftly and it caught my eye. And in front of thousands who were there as military sergeants and military personnel, a statement was made and he said that all religions, all religions, within Europe are dying, except for Islam. These are words coming from the mouth of the very man who's written a book called The God Delusion. 
These are the words of the man who has written books against religions, completely against religions. And it's interesting that when we analyze this point, what would make a man who is completely against all religions, matter of fact, a staunch enemy and an advocate of atheism all over the world, make such a statement and say that all religions are dying except for the religion of Islam? What the religion of Islam has, what does it have that other religions don't have? And why has it succeeded? Now this discussion is important on one main level is that the minute you and I lose contact with an all divine creator the morals and the standards of society start to break down and erode. An existence of a God means that I have a set moral template which I use to fulfill my life. And any human being who does not have a religion nor a God can never claim logically that I have a set system of morals which I go by daily. Because any moral institution which is set and junctioned by anybody other than a divine God is bound to change continuously. And if a set of moral rules are continuously changing within society, you and I are continuously confused about our morals. Because one day I can wake up and killing can be evil. The next day I can wake up and killing can be something good. The change of morals within society depends on how set the moral structure is within society. Hence when I find something, for example, like homosexuality within the United States, 50 or 70 years ago was not accepted. It was tabooed. It was something frowned down upon. Today, such a concept is widely accepted and many are practicing it and legalizing it. The reason for this is because the morals of society keep changing. In the 1800s, we had something called the prohibition where alcohol was banned. Years later, alcohol was once again brought into the system because people could not control alcohol consumption. When you look at all these historical models, you'll come to find that our existence, my existence and your existence, is completely revolving around one moral template which needs to be set. The only set standard to akhlaq and morality is when you hold on to a religion where your decrees are now divine. Hence realize in the Quran, Allah says, Fitrat Allah illati fatar nasa alayha la tabdeela li khalqillah. When Allah sets a decree, it doesn't change. When Allah sets a rule, when Allah says killing is evil, killing, you should avoid it, it's going to be that way until the day of judgment. Hence, when you accept a divine decree or a divine moral law, it's much more powerful and much more useful than anybody who accepts a non-divinely appointed moral code. Because if I say that science sets my moral code and your moral code, the assumption there is science deals deals with good and evil and you and I know very well that no scientist deals with a good or evil because there's no such thing as a good molecule or a bad molecule there's no such thing as a good atom or a bad atom all science knows is miracle is empirical measurements hence science can never bring about my moral laws any individual who says science is enough to give me my morals and my rules has been misconstrued with a system of morality which is bound to shake. The way you and I control our society's moral system is by holding on to the ultimate moral rope, which is the Quran, Muhammad and Ahlul Bayt. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. For this main reason, Hassan, thank you. If you can just take it back because it might spill. Thank you. For this main reason, such a discussion is extremely important. Why do I discuss a concept of a God? Why does it need to be discussed? Why should it be open? Because in order for my morals to not flip and flop, my existence needs to be set by a moral template. Otherwise, men who kill 5 million or 10 million, men who kill left, right and center in the name of religion can be authorized. Men who go, for example, Adolf Hitler, when he kills people, when he kills millions in Germany, in his mind, what he's doing is correct. And nobody's to stop him because his moral template says that it's correct what he's doing. 
When a person like Saddam Hussein goes into Iraq and kills millions, within his moral template, he believes that what he's doing is okay. Hence, if there's no set template, if there's no set moral structure divinely given, and this is the reason why we need a Quran, a Prophet, and a Atra, then you and I become lost sheep. All of us. We become lost sheep. We one day walk around doing good things, the next day we walk around doing evil things. Hence, anybody who says religion is not a necessity in our existence is merely fooling themselves. Because a human being without a religion is a human being without a moral aim. In order to have that moral aim, the existence of a religion has to be there. Now, Islam has flourished within itself within three major areas. The first area is the way that Islam holds on to Tawheed is extremely different than many other religions. Very different. Islam, the way it holds on to Tawheed is very different. Even within universities, when you go to a comparative religions class, the way they describe Tawheed in Islam, they call it ultra, ultra, ultra monotheistic. Ultra monotheistic. Why is that? Because Islam prides itself in believing in an ultra monotheistic system where everything rotates around Allah and around Tawheed. And the way that we prove the existence of God is not completely theoretical, is not completely spiritual. Versus other religions who use spirit over reason, Islam takes spirit and reason and combines them to make the ultimate system. Because when you examine, for example, Hinduism, Hinduism uses extreme measures of spirituality. There's not much reason involved within a god. If you ask them, give me a logical reason why your god has eight arms, there is no logical reason for that. When somebody says to, me, to, to them, give me a logical reason why your god can be seen as a human, there's no logical reason to that. When you ask them, why is it that Vishnu cut the head of Shiva off and then put on an elephant's head? There is no logical explanation to that. It's simply faith and no reason. Islam comes in a reformation to say, hold on. There has to be a system of reason and faith. Because there are some out there who reject religion completely. Saying, you know what, because there are so many religions out there, they're probably all the same. Because there's so many religions out there and I'm so confused, I have no time to do research as to which religion is the same. All religions are probably the same. And I reject religion completely. Not realizing that when a human being says something like that, you just put the monotheistic Muslim on the same level as a polytheistic Christian. Or a polytheistic, for example, Hindu, who believes in a cow as a god versus a Muslim who believes in an infinite unseen god. There's a big difference between that. Hence, you need to come and break down religions to understand what's the main difference. And even in proving the existence of a God, Islam takes an interesting approach. Shahid al-Sadr gives a beautiful explanation as to the theories revolving around proving God's existence. And he gives a magnificent example. He says, within the world of science today, if a scientist wants to prove some sort of theory, he comes up with arguments or main empirical support, to support and substantiate his reasons. He then gives his reasons and upon these laws and these reasons, he builds upon them in order to make a larger claim. He gives an example. Today we know that the earth was at one point part of the sun which separated. This is something known today. Now, were scientists available during that time to see? Of course not. Has anybody witnessed this? Of course not. And has anybody been able to empirically see it or measure it? No. How has science come up with such an explanation? The following. We looked at the elements within the earth and the elements within the sun and realized there's a similar connection between the two elements. There's a click. We looked at the axis which the earth revolves around and the axis of the sun and realized that they're very similar. The speed of rotation is very similar. The earth at one point was extremely hot and so was the sun, extremely similar. After taking all of these signs and putting them together, we've come up with this theory or this solution that the earth at one point was part of the sun. Logically, it makes much sense. 
When someone attacks God, typically the attack is against the idea that you, the way you prove your God is not very logical. Where the way a Muslim proves the existence of his Lord is the same way the scientist proves the existence that the sun or the earth was once part of a sun. As a Muslim, I look at everything around me. I say, my God, what perfection has everything been created from? And I mentioned this three nights ago, Imam Sadiq alayhi salam looks at his companion Mufaddal. He says to him, Mufaddal, do you see that bird simply examining a bird? He says, Mufaddal, do you see the aerodynamic body of the bird? Do you see how magnificently it flies? He says, God has created it that way. He has made it that way. It helps the bird fly aerodynamically. He then says to Mufaddal, only examining a bird, he says, Mufaddal, look once more. Do you see the wings of the bird, how the feathers open to let air pass through? He says, that allows the bird to go higher in altitude or lower in altitude. He says, Mufaddal, do you realize that the bird lays eggs and does not carry its young ones in its stomach? He says, why? He says, this allows the bird and helps the bird fly because if it was to carry its young ones within its stomach, it would be too heavy to fly. Imam then looks at Mufaddal. He says, Mufaddal, are these signs of an intelligent designer? Is there a sign? Hence along the Quran says, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ Allah continuously says there are so many signs out there for you and I that this has to point finger to an almighty creator. For if I came in here and I saw a beautiful portrait on the wall and I examined the portrait and I fell in so much love with that portrait to say that the portrait was drawn by accident and that the very basis is just a carbon based portrait and there's no painter for that portrait would be logical due to the beauty and the creation of that portrait. Imagine I walk by a painting and the painter is standing next to me and I walk by and I say, wow, what a beautiful painting created itself very beautifully. The lines that are on there, my God, magnificent. The brush strokes are just perfect. My God, the colors are amazing. And the way that the scenery has set itself, what magnificence. Surely it's all an accident. It has to be. And the painter is standing next to me and says, Habibi, I just drew that last night. What are you doing? <laughs> Imagine the arguments that you and I use, me and you would not even accept to think that this microphone that I'm using right now was created by an accident. It's not even practical. To think you and I that the floor we're sitting on was created by accident, we would never buy that. Go even deeper. The buttons that might be on our clothes, to think that even those were accidents, how impractical of us as human beings. And we walk around devaluing our existence. The biggest problem that I have with, with the movement of atheism is that it devalues my existence. I feel so devalued when a human being comes to me and says that you are but a carbon-based walking, talking computer which will one day die and erode. Imagine somebody saying such a statement to you, that you are merely a walking, talking carbon computer and you do nothing less but chemically feel and you chemically love and you chemically feel the spirit and everything in you is so chemically based that one day you'll chemically die and you'll chemically be in the grave. And I feel like a carbon based footprint where nothing happens in my life and I should just not care. Matter of fact, why exist? And the irony, brothers and sisters, here's the irony in our lives. The same person who believes that he's a carbon footprint and that he's worth nothing and that his existence was an accident, the minute he gets sick, man, does he struggle. And if the hospital is hours away, he'll drive all the way to get to the hospital that he can fix himself up again. But I thought we were all carbon-based computers. I thought we were all carbon-based creatures. Why, need, why take the time to devalue yourself and go to the clinic or go to the hospital? Stay at home because if you live, you're a carbon-based computer. And if you die, you're a carbon-based computer. So there's no point in really existing. Why even try on this earth? Why even wake up in the, mother in, in the morning and tell your spouse, I love you? Why tell your mother, I love you? Because at the end of the day, we're all just carbon-based. This kind of thinking 
destroys our mentalities. It devalues the human being to such a level that you and I feel like mere paper. Hence, the leaders out there who are doing the killing, the leaders out there who are doing the killing in the name of religion and misconstrued religion for, for atheism, when they kill to them, there is no ideology of belief. It makes killing the human being in an instant so simple. It makes getting rid of the human being so simple because we die and we turn into nothing. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. The pride of the religion of Islam is that you and I are much more than carbon-based computers and we have such a power within us which lies within us. And any human being who devalues his existence and say my existence is not very much valued, my existence does not have that much value, is actually belittling himself and belittling his creator. For the very second that you say I've got no value as an individual, Allah is stating within the Quran, he says, have we not given you two ears? Have we not given you two eyes? Have we not given you a tongue? Have we not given you a mouth? Have we not created you? Have we, were you not a clot of semen which clings and then we gave you bones and we gave you skin, we gave you flesh? Allah says, فَتَبَارَكَ اللَّهُ أَحْسَنَ الْخَالِقِينَ That's the beauty of my existence. Oh Allah, I'm not just a chance-based creature. I am walking, talking, feeling. I'm spirit involved, I am self involved, I am soul involved and never belittle my existence or lie to me in telling me that I am merely a carbon based computer. Hence the religion of Islam on the first level prides itself when it comes to Tawheed. Tawheed within the religion of Islam is unshook. Even Imam Sadiq alayhi salam once a man came to him, look at the tolerance of the Imam. He says to him, oh Imam, I've, I've recently created worms. He brings worms to the Imam, he gives it to him. He says, Imam, I've recently created worms. Imagine somebody comes to you and says, uh, bro, I've created worms, I feel like I'm God. <laughs> I've just created worms, I feel like I'm God. And this man comes to the Imam, look at the tolerance of the Imam. He says, you've created something, he says, yes. He says, I saw some soil, I picked it up, I shook it, worms emerged. Imam says, show me, where did these worms come from? He takes the Imam to where he was standing. He sets the worms on the ground and Imam says to him, tell me, I've got one question for you, as their creator, since you've created them, tell me these worms, how much do they weigh? Imam, he looks at the Imam, God, you know, I've got no idea actually. Imam says to him, okay, that's fine, one more question. He says, tell me, as their creator, which one of these two is their gender male and which one of these two is their gender female? Because you've got to let me know as their creator, you must know. He looks at the Imam and he says, you know what, I, don't, I have no idea. Imam says, no problem, one last question, please, one, one more. He says to the Imam, looks at him, he says, as their creator, you must have dominance and control on them because these worms have to be dependent on you. He says, so tell them as their creator, instead of moving to the left, let them move to the right. As a creator of these creatures, Instead of having them move from the left, make them move to the right. And he looks at the Imam baffled. He says, I swear God knows where to put his message. Look at the logic of the Imam. The beauty of the logic of the Imam. Another man comes to Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, his companion Hisham. He says to him, oh Imam, an argument has been given to me which has baffled me. The pride in monotheism, I tell you, with the messenger of Allah and with our Ahlul Bayt is unmatched. He looks at the Imam, he says to him, Oh Imam, someone asked me a question today, which I wasn't able to answer. He says, go ahead. He says, an atheist argued with me and said, if your God is all powerful, can he take the whole universe and put it inside of an egg without changing the size of the universe and without changing the size of the egg? Can your God do that if he's so powerful? Imam alayhi salam brilliantly looks at him and he replies, he says to him, Allah has already done that. What do you mean Allah has already done that? Imam says to him, examine your eye. The eye that you have within it holds the whole universe. Everything around you, the whole universe can be seen within your eye. Your eye is as small as an egg. Imam says Allah has already done that for you. The reply of the Imam is so exact, so precise. 
The honor of the religion of Islam and one of the reasons why it's been maintained over the years is because you and I have been able to strengthen it through Tawheed. The second reason is what we discussed two nights ago, which is the concept of infallibility. The third reason that within the West especially, Islam has had such a strong growth and so much spread is because of the hijab which Allah has prescribed. We don't realize, but especially the hijab of the sisters is a flag for the religion of Islam. When I see somebody wearing a hijab, I immediately know that this is a Muslim. This constant remembrance through seeing the flag of Islam aids the spread of the message. Anything you see today which the media attacks, the words terrorism, the words for example oppress, all of these are the strongest elements of the religion of Islam which when attacked try to defame Islam. The irony is the more that the media hits on these topics, the more the people start to understand and research and realize what Islam is about. So as much as they attack you and I, the marketing is actually in our favor. Interestingly, hijab acts as a solace for the female, especially within the West. It's interesting to me, it's ironic, that as an individual living in the United States, I can walk out of my house wearing anything I want, piercing my body top to bottom. I can get horns coming out of my head if I wanted to, I can implant them. I can get piercings all over, I can split my body into two. Allah knows, I can tattoo myself top to bottom. I swear to you, not a single individual would say a word. Matter of fact, I might be even honored in the book of world records. It's ironic, I might even be honored. Interestingly, when a female decides to wear hijab, the world stands and doesn't sit. Look at the irony. Why is it that when you see somebody doing things like that, there's no problem? But why is it that when you see hijab, the world stands and doesn't sit in France? The aristocrats are so moved by hijab. And I believe there, are so, there is so much aristocracy within France that's part of the reason why females hated hijab there. Because it reminds them of their humble state. When a female wears hijab, her overall appearance becomes extremely humble. Why is it that when you see somebody like that who's destroying himself, piercing himself, tattooing himself, creating horns for himself, nobody says a word. But the minute we see hijab, aha, terrorism, we've got it. Why? Because it reminds you of something greater. There's a higher level of understanding here. I swear to you, once I was sitting in the state of California next to a phone within a masjid. And the brother who was responsible for the masjid wasn't there. The phone rings, I pick it up. And I, I narrate this story because it interests me, the extremism and the lack of depth of certain people. It's extremely interesting. I pick up the phone and I can tell from the voice that this woman who was on the phone was extremely angry, very angry. How are you doing? She says, can I talk to a Muslim immediately? Can I talk to a Muslim, please? I said, sure, go ahead, I'm a Muslim. She says, you know what, you Muslims, you people are terroristic. You people make your women wear these black shrouds. You know, you are responsible for so many killings around the world. I don't know what to say about you. I said, let's start one argument at a time so we can actually get through something. She says, let's talk about this black shroud. I swear to you, let's talk about this black shroud. I said to her, what religion are you? She says, I'm a Christian. I said to her, as a Christian, have you ever been to church? She says, of course. I said, have you seen the picture of Mary? She says, yeah. I said, what's Mary wearing on her head? Any picture you see of Mary, Mary is wearing a veil on her head. Furthermore, refer to the Bible, refer to Corinthians, St. Paul describes a female who is respected with the words that she wears a veil over her head. Hence, examine the nuns. Why is it that the Arabians already had hijab within Arabia? Because the nuns used to wear it. And the Arabians were inspired by that, hence certain females were wearing almost a bandana style hijab in the time of the Messenger of Allah. So she says to me, yes, I've seen it, but it's unfortunate that we need to become modern. This is typically the argument, that the more time that advances, the more modern I need to become. And the thought process here is that the more modern I become, the less clothes I wear. 
So I said to her, according to your argument, let me understand this correctly, the more time that passes by, the more modern we become, the less clothing we should wear. So according to my statistics and the calculations that I'm making in my head right now, in 50 years, you and I will be walking around unclothed because the more modern we become, the less clothes we should wear. According to this argument that you're placing in front of me, within 50 to 75 years, we most likely will walk around not wearing anything. Immediately she clicks the phone. And I said in that moment, Allah, you've set such a religion that anybody who dares challenge it, anybody who comes in front of it, Allah says, I've given you the answers. I've given you the ability to transact. I've given you the ability to understand it. Why is hijab so far today? Because it's a flag of something greater. When that person who's killing the child in Gaza sees a woman wearing hijab, his heart trembles. When a person who's aristocratic, who owns millions, who spends on millions, and he sees a humble human being wearing hijab, that immediately changes his whole perception. Now today, hijab is not only for females, it's for males and for females. Interestingly, the more that the males observe what they wear, the easier it makes it for females to wear the hijab. And I'm going to say this very bluntly, that the more the males adhere to the way they wear their hijab, the more the females understand how to wear the hijab. Here's what I mean. Imagine a brother and a sister. A brother walks out from the house. He's wearing shorts, which are very short, for example. Not up to the knees, maybe a bit shorter. He's wearing um, cut-off sleeves. He's wearing something which is extremely revealing as a young man. And next to him is his sister wearing a full abaya. Imagine that image in your head. That a man is walking outside of the house, not covered at all, very little clothing, some of the tightest clothing you could see. And he expects that after leaving the house, my sister should wear full hijab. The picture doesn't add up. You look at the sister, you say, where'd you get this guy from? Did you just go to the club, take him, pull him out, and make him walk with you? Where did he come from? The picture doesn't add up. Hence, even within our communities, in our societies, in our families, if we want our sisters to wear hijab, we need to adhere to the way we dress as well. Because the picture doesn't add up. When you see two people walking in the streets, and one looks completely different than the other, and the brother is telling his sister, lower your gaze, make sure you wear hijab. And the sister looks at him and says to him, what are you wearing in order for me to wear what I'm wearing? There has to be a such structure between them. Hence, hijab becomes a flag for the religion of Islam. Anything in society that you see today, the media attacks, and one of them is this very idea that Islam is a terroristic religion. And I've stated this, as much as 9-11 is one of the worst things which happened in human history, and may Allah curse the ones who were involved in such a movement, this, the belief, the amount of change that it reformed within America, within Europe, the change that it brought, the numbers of people who came towards the religion of Islam, because of such an event is absolutely astronomical. You'll find Islam today is the largest growing religion in the world. Largest growing religion. Is it because we need to be the largest growing? It's because Allah Azza wa Jalla has decreed that when I sent down this religion, this religion will grow. Why? Because it's haq. The minute you and I hold on to this haq, we resonate with it, we take it, we hold it, and we mold it within our lives, haq starts to emerge. Hence, Aba Abdullah alayhi salam. What's the movement? It's haq. It's aslah. Imam says, I came to make a change within my society. I came with a reform system. I came with a chain system. I came with a specific movement that I needed to make. And hence Imam Alayhi salam, when he does go towards Karbala, and when he does meet his companions, when he does meet men like Hur, when he does meet men, for example, like Habib ibn Mawahar, all of these men who were with the Imam were so gravitated by the truth which he held that they reformed their visions. Take a look at a man like Hur. When Imam alayhi salam was coming towards Kufa, the man who stops him in the middle of the road and diverts him to go towards Karbala was Hur. Hur actually stops the Imam and says to him, Oh Imam, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, my horses are thirsty and my men are thirsty. Can I get water from you? Look at the kindness of the Imam. Look at the khulq. That akhlaq in Islam is not when somebody is kind to you and you are kind to them. Akhlaq is when somebody is unkind to you and you are kind to them. That's akhlaq. 
within the religion of Islam. Akhlaq is not that someone is extremely kind to me and I am kind once again to them. Akhlaq is when somebody is unkind to me and I meet them with kindness. That's akhlaq. Because when somebody is kind to you, it's very easy to be kind to them. When somebody is nice to you, it's very easy to be nice to them. But when somebody mistreats you, when somebody is arrogant towards you and you maintain your kindness, that's true akhlaq. Imam Alayhi Salam takes out water and he gives water to a thousand soldiers. A thousand. He gives water to all of his enemies. All of them drink that day. When it was time for Salat al Dhuhr, all of them came behind the Imam and they prayed. They all prayed with the Imam. Later, Hur takes the Imam and he diverts him towards Karbala. He takes the army and he diverts the Imam towards Karbala. But the truth that he saw from the Imam the khuluq that he saw from the Imam moved him so much. It changed him so much. In the middle of the battlefield, I ask you by Allah, have you seen a battle where you have 30,000 versus 72? None of the 30, none of the 72 go to the 30,000, but dozens of the 30,000 go to the 72. Have you seen such a battle in your life? Have we ever seen something like this in history? In no battle in history do the ones who are lesser have, do they gain more followers? Imam Alayhi Salam had only 72 in Karbala. Dozens came from the army of Ibn Ziyad. None of the Imam's armies went toward him. None of the Imam's army went towards Ibn Ziyad, but many came from that army towards the Imam's army. You know what that tells you? That tells you that Imam's message was so gravitating, was so moving, that at that point, numbers didn't matter. And Imam Alayhi Salam, a night before Karbala, the night before Karbala is sitting in his tent because he asks his brother Al-Abbas, he says to him, ask the armies for one night. Let's have one more night that we can sit together and we can recite the Quran. He says, I swear by Allah, I love reciting the Quran. One night. And Imam alayhi salam is in his tent. The one who enters is his sister Zainab. And she says to him, my dear brother, have you tested your companions? Have you seen what kind of people they are? Have you tested them? He says to her sister, I've tested them so much. I have found them in love with dying. I have tested them so much. I found that if they give their whole existence for the religion of Islam, because they believe it's haq and completely haq, if they give their whole existence, they don't care. And she says to him, brother, tomorrow what's happening? What is going to happen? Imam Hussain alayhi salam discloses it piece by piece. He says to her sister, I fear to tell you. And I think about it. How does a brother tell his sister that tomorrow you're going to see me headless on the sands? How do you say that to your sister? How does a brother tell his sister that tomorrow your two sons will be killed, oh sister Zainab? Tomorrow my sons will be killed. Tomorrow Haliul Akbar will be killed. Tomorrow Al Abbas will be killed. Tomorrow you will go at hostage. How do you say that to your sister? My God, what a moving situation. I think about that. And I think about the responsibility Lady Zainab had to take within that moment. Because it's no joke to take responsibility for a full family. Hence when Imam Alayhi Salam later dies, Lady Zainab becomes the tent for the children. And as the poet says, Zainab lifat yam she says, brother, my heart is aching. Why is everyone here around us? What's happening in Karbala? What's going to happen tomorrow? What are my responsibilities? طبت لي أهل الخيمة طبت لي أهل الخيمة وعلى خته الدم عتها طبت قعدة قبالة وتفسر الصقر ونتها تقل علي تقل علي Say, but 
شالف لي يا ماي العين لا تخفي علي احسن علي من هالفزع صوبين She says brother Abba Abdullah disclose all the information to me what will happen to you later on اتقل لأخوي حسين سالف لي علي من تجر هالرايات وشوف القدر حج الخيل تركض فوق المسنات يا حسين قلبي 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 بوجل يا ابن أمي عليك وعلى الحواش مبا خويا قلبي خايف على اهلي هم وحده ابتلت مثلي يا بقلبي قلبي خايف على اهلي اي هم وحده ابتلت مثلي والله تقول لاخويا لكاتبك يا حزين من هالناس Zainab looks so much about Abdullah. She says, "My dear brother, who'll take care of us tomorrow?" And he said, "Lahoo, ya siyat man, ya siyat bina, ya ya man tajm al qaba alina, ya ba ya siyat wa siyat man." She says, brother, may I have a word with Habib ibn Mudahir, the leader of your army. One man sends the news to Habib. He says to him, Habib, Zainab wishes to speak to you. Habib is sitting on top of his horse. He comes down from his horse. He starts slapping his face. He says, who am I that Zainab, Zainab, the daughter of Ali wants to speak to me? He goes, I'm not يا بوحي مخدرة يا تعبا يا يا هي هي my dear Iman I wish you could see Lady Zainu as she walked in sound the hall inside the hall of Yazid and the wife of Yazid does not recognize Lady Zainu. Hind was the servant of Lady Zainab alayhi salam within the days of Medina. She loved the smell of Ahlul Bayt. She loved the sight of Ahlul Bayt. Lady Zainab alayhi salam recognizes Hind. She says to her, Hind approaches her. She says to her, oh sister, which land are you from? Lady Zainab says to her, oh sister, we are from 
from the land of Rasulullah. Hind says, I have a family from that land. I know the family of Amir al Mu'mineen. <laughs> Zainab salam looks at her. She says to her, What are their names? Hind says to her, Tell me about my master, Hussein. <laughs> she says to her, Tell me about my master, Abu al Fadl al She says to her, Ya Hind, if you look for Abu Abdullah, his head is on that spear. And if you look for Abu Fadl al Abbas, we've left his body on Shat al And if you ask for Zainab, Zainab al As if she says to him, Habibi Hussein, my brother Hussein, where do I start treating you? Do I start wrapping your body from your legs, or do I take care of the three headed arrow? <laughs> Brothers and sisters, let's raise our hand towards dua together, inshaAllah. We have a brother yesterday who had asked us, one of his friends, his relatives is extremely ill. Another brother today asked us that his family, some relatives are also extremely ill. Please, let's raise our hands and make dua, especially when we recite together. And if there's anybody sitting next to you who's a young child, have them raise their hands because from young children, the purity of the heart, Allah inshallah will accept. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allah, 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 Allah,
حوائجنا يا الله ربنا لا تسلط علينا من لا يرحمنا يا الله اخواننا المظلومين في العالم احفظهم بحفظك يا الله make us leaders on the path of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad ويرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات نقرأ سورة المباركة الفاتحة تسبقها الصلوات